Wait, is this just gate? Chapter 318. Written by Pepper Antique. James and Amina only spent three days in Jadesport before boarding Ferrier's airship and beginning the next leg of their trip. They spent the first day catching up with Amina's uncle, General Sigbert. His army was being pulled back from the area outside of the city due to the blight there being removed by whatever Joey had done with it. He thanked James, even as he wrapped the younger man in a bear hug and gave his condolences for his loss. The second day they'd spent talking with the city mayor. The mayor threw them a massive feast and party, in thanks for their aid with the blight spawn, and also for whatever they'd done to remove the blight as well. But it was also a celebration of the princess's wedding. James joined in the cheers, and gave short toasts when it was appropriate. And to anyone else he would have seemed like a cheerful, if quietly bashful, new spouse. But Amina knew differently. She saw the way he shifted uncomfortably whenever the blight was mentioned. The way he was quick to drink whenever a toast was made, though he managed to avoid getting drunk. She saw the way his laughter, though loud and quick to rise, was equally quick to fade. How he would frequently stare into his cup whenever he thought nobody was looking. She resolved to use the third day in the city to fix this, even if only a little bit. So, on the third day she took him shopping. They avoided all the places that they'd been to before, sticking to the parts of the city on the other side of the trade channel. At first they purchased simple things, some extra furnishings for their room on the airship, a few sets of winter clothes for when their route took them a little further north and into cold weather. But then she took him to a part of town that she hadn't actually been to in years. Not since Keela had found out that she was pregnant with her twins. James stopped in front of one of the shops and looked at the display. In it were a set of baby clothes in a variety of colors and, thanks to the nature of this world, different body types as well. He looked at the shops next to it and saw toys in one, and maternity clothes in the other. Amina? He asked curiously. Yes? She replied. Why are we looking at a bunch of baby stuff? He turned and saw that the shop behind them was full of cribs and various types of furniture made for babies and nursing mothers. Are you trying to tell me something? Yes and no, she said wistfully. She took his hand and used her other hand to point at a small onesie that had a simple embroidered pattern of smeplies, apples, and something that looked like a banana, though it was straight rather than curved. We should get that one for Vilairi, she said after he'd had a chance to look at it a bit. And I bet if we asked they would probably have one that looks like little mage robes. James took a deep breath as he realized what she meant. He wiped his eyes with his sleeve as he turned to her with one of the first genuine smiles he'd had since their wedding. I think that'd be cute. He said once he'd gotten himself together. Long as it comes with a pointy hat that flops over. Then he let her lead him into the store. And they ended up buying for little outfits. Then they hit all the stores nearby and bought much much more for James's future nephew and niece. As they walked back to the ship, with two shop assistants pushing wagons along behind them, Amina smiled as she saw James actually looking happy once again. Even if it was likely only temporary. King Farik was just finishing up with a royal decree that he hoped would help alleviate some of the strain the druids were dealing with now, when someone knocked at his study door. Who is it? He asked. He was accustomed to unexpected visits. But he still didn't like them. Chief Vickers, sir. The large word jaguar rumbled through the door. Come in chief. He replied as he turned the decree over and slid it aside. The door opened and Vickers stepped in gingerly. The king had been surprised to learn of the man's request and subsequent approval of conversion. Though, having seen him in motion and learned of his relationship with the outer light knight, he was no longer confused by it. Hope I'm not interrupting anything. Vickers said as he stepped forward. Mind if I sit? King Farik gestured at the chair across from him. Everyone almost always is when you're a king. He said with a slight grin. How can I help you chief? He asked. Vickers sat, let out a quick gasp of surprise before standing up a bit and adjusting his tail, then sat down all the way. Still getting used to the new body I take it? The king asked with a hint of amusement. Bits and pieces. Vickers admitted. 
Have you had a chance to interrogate the agency members that Chief Driscoll apprehended? That caught the king's attention. He sat up a bit straighter and rested his hands on the table. A few. He replied. Several died of their injuries before we had a chance to. And one of them managed to kill themselves before we could stop them. But we've successfully interrogated too. Though I use the word successfully as loosely as possible there. Vickers nodded. Sounds about right. He said. Then he pulled up his phone and retrieved the footage of his interview with Driscoll. Well I talked to the tin can. And I figured we could compare notes. The two lies are going over his suit's logs. Trying to see what they can figure out in terms of location tracking and what not. He slid the phone across the desk and hit the play button. While the king watched the video, only a little more than ten minutes when all was said and done, Vickers fished out an envelope with a letter inside. One that was eerily similar to the one he'd sent out a few months earlier. That all seems to line up. The king. Albeit with what little we were capable of getting. He looked at the letter in Vickers' hands. What's that? Vickers held it out and let the king take it. A chance to earn the muck marcher's loyalty, assuming it doesn't kill them. He said as the king read it over, his eyes widening as he did. Plus it might earn a bit of favor with my government. And it would give us a hell of a weapon against the agency. Driscoll wants to go scorched earth on M. Ah hand I kinda wanna let him. This. The king said as he waved the letter at Vickers. This is a mighty large gamble. Chief Vickers. And you want me to allow this to happen with two of the people who almost killed my daughter? Who nearly killed the archmage? Your own captain? Vickers held his hands up in mock surrender. Never said it wasn't a risk. Plus, like I said, it'll probably kill M. And that's assuming it even works at all. That's why I didn't sign M. Y. name to it. King Farik looked, and sure enough the signature block at the bottom was blank. I just figured it was an option. And if the two lies can get us a location, a couple of wolfed up muck marchers with a bone to pick might be a mighty nice ace in the hole. Vickers said. But I'll leave that decision to you. The king looked back at the image on Vickers' phone one more time before sliding it back across from him. He couldn't deny the anger in Driscoll's eyes. And he'd already seen what the man could do with no idea what was going on and missing an arm. I'll consider it. He said firmly. But I don't like the idea of them having the same kind of power you do. He left out the part where he barely liked Vickers having that power. That's all I'm asking sir. Vickers replied as he stood up and began making his way toward the door. I'll keep you updated on the suit data. Samantha walked through the hall nervously. She was about halfway back to her, human, form now. But even still, she could hear and smell the people waiting in the room at the end of the hall waiting for them. The room marked, Conference Hall B. She kept glancing around nervously from within her hood, as if ensuring that Dr. Munro was still there. She was, and she smiled at Samantha each time she looked her way. She stopped in her tracks as she got within a few feet of the door. Dr. Munro stopped as well. Is everything okay Samantha? She asked. Is this? She began. Is this really a good idea? She could tell that all the chatter inside the room had quieted, and knew that all eyes would be on her as soon as she entered. Do you really think this is okay? Dr. Munro looked back and forth between her and the door a few times as she thought of what to say. They're like you. She said finally. Some of them have embraced their change a little more easily. But they're all just as lost. Just as alone, even when they aren't. And all in need of someone they can actually relate to. Samantha couldn't deny that she felt alone. Even with the doctor helping her. With her father only a phone call away. With the hospital staff slowly but surely becoming more comfortable around her. She felt like she was on her own. She stepped forward, grasped the door handle and pulled. And as she stepped in eight sets of golden canine eyes just like hers looked toward her, and locked on her own. She felt the fur on her neck and back stand on end. They all stayed that way for a moment. Then a large, slightly grey-furred, wolf near the far end of the room spoke. 
you're the one that had the shield. They asked in a slightly German accented voice. The ah. Uh, Wonder Woman? She looked at Dr. Munro, though she kept the other werewolves in her peripheral vision almost on instinct. Dr. Munro nodded. I. Was. She said hesitantly. The large grey wolf nodded at her answer. Thank you for stopping the big one. He said after a moment. Sorry you turned back. Some of the other wolves, though not all of them, were nodding agreement. Thanks. She said, unsure of what else there was to say. Did. A small wolf, that must have only been a young teen at most, asked from a few seats away from her. Did that. God lady, talk to you too? Behind the young girl were two people that Samantha assumed were her parents. Um. Yeah. Samantha admitted. She seemed mean. The young wolf said. I didn't like her. Me neither. Samantha agreed. Then she pulled up the empty seat near her and sat down. I guess you said no to what she told you to do. The young girl looked back at her parents. My mom and dad said not to listen to people I don't know. Especially if they seem mean. Samantha looked at the two parents and smiled. That's good. She said. Then she looked around at everyone else. Did you all speak with her too? They all nodded and looked around at each other too. Well. She said after a moment. S.H.E., whoever she was, wasn't the one that gave me the Wonder Woman powers. Even the few werewolves who hadn't been taking part in the conversation up until that point, perked up at that. That was a different. God. She finished. The handful of other doctors in the room looked at Dr. Munro with raised eyebrows. She simply gestured for them to pay attention as the wolves began to talk in earnest. And she was happy to see how quickly Samantha was opening up compared to when she'd first woken back up in the hospital.